The S in IoT stands for security. It's funny because it's mostly true. But not today. Today, we're going to talk about how to break into the M2 IoT device from Minute. First, let's uh, make something clear. So the M2, as far as I understand, is the same as the P2, is the same as the point. Um, these are the production devices that came after a Kickstarter run that Minute made, and they then uh, launched these devices and they sold them for many years. And I bought them back in 2019, I think. Um, they now have a newer sensor on the market, the M3. So I just want to make that clear that I am talking specifically about the M2 here in this video and video series. Um, I don't know anything about the M3. I haven't looked at the M3. Um, I know that it has a newer uh, MCU or SOC, uh, but everything I'm going through here is, is regarding the M2. It's uh, fully supported. Um, you can connect it to their API. Uh, this is a cloud-based service. Um, you have uh, um, an application in your phone that you can use um, to, to handle your devices if you're more than one. Um, funny thing, um, I bought a few and then when they pivoted to short-term rental, they sort of assumed that if you had more than one, you had more than one short-term rental. And once they removed their free tier of the cloud API, they then sort of assumed that, you know, if you have more than one sensor, you should pay more than one uh, cloud subscription. Um, we actually ended up with me offering them to come out to my place to have coffee uh, so they could see that that's not what I was doing. I live pretty close by to their Malmo office. They declined, but we ended up with me just paying the single subscription, which I think is, is the right thing. Anyway, if you know anything about hacking IoT devices, uh, if you watch Matt Brown's video series, and I think you should, link below, um, you know that all you have to do is to open them up, find the SBI flash, read out the SBI flash, and now you have all the secrets and you can go and do whatever you want. So, of course, let's do that. Okay, so here's the device. Let's um, unpack it. The model is the MTP2. That's indeed the point slash uh, P2 slash M2. Let's try to get this out. Minute. Actually, minute in Swedish and also means uh, minute. Happy hosting starts here. All right. I'm happy. Here is our device. This is the magnetic uh, connecting plate. Uh, you can either put that up with the sticky tape or screws and it will connect to the device like so, and you hang it somewhere. The device knows whether it's connected to this magnetic plate or not. So if you, if you have an evil hacker that's going to go after your device, uh, you will actually get notified when they remove it from the plate. Uh, we're going to talk more about that. And here we can see on the back that we have an off on, we have charging, it's a built in battery, a reset button and some, you know, secret sauce. Um, okay, there it is. All right, so we have the uh, SBI extracted. Uh, we can check the size of it. It's uh, a four megabyte flash. And you know, since we've learned all about how to hack IoT devices, we now do bin walk, minute SBI bin. Wow, we have a certificate, but you know, that's actually a false positive. Bin walk finds absolutely nothing in this external flash. That's a bit of a bummer. Let's do strings on this file. Wow, okay, so that was um, a few false hits, but you know, um, 
I see some things here. OK, SBC.FW. Um, OK, OK, there's lots of that OK thing. Error, error. OK, Let, let's check all the files. Uh, .fw, I think. So let's grab on the .fw. Wow, OK. All right, I think we will need to uh, unique these, right? Okay, uh, firmware manifest, application firmware, boot firmware, boot firmware again, uh, BLE, Bluetooth Loth Energy, NVRAM. Okay, so this, this looks okay. Um, apparently, we have some sort of file system here, and we need to figure out how to extract these files. To cut a long story short, that took some time. Now let's let let me show you this. Um, let's look at the minute SPI here. Um, it starts off with the uh, identifier part, um, obviously a partition, but this is no standard format whatsoever. If we continue, that that part is a K in size. Um, we get something here. Um, FS dirty, well, obviously the file system dirty. Spool TS, well, okay, um, reasonable. SPWL and data spool. So I spent a considerable amount of time looking into this. And, and I now know uh, what it is. It's actually the SPIFS file system and one of the reasons I could figure that out was using these um, how they point to um, pages 256 bytes in size uh, where the data is. Um, we can also see a lot of these FFFF and it turns out that the files that I was the most interested in looking at the application firmware and the boot firmware they are erased on the file system. They are not here anymore. There were a few pages um, that weren't erased. And from those, I could see that all of this is encrypted. Uh, you know, that's, that's why Binwalk doesn't find anything. Um, so this is a, a SPIFS file system. It's not obviously readable with any of the uh, open source tools that exist, the MK spiffs and the spiffs image. I have modified them uh, so that they understand the minute spiffs file system. And I am able to extract files from this SBI flash. Um, not that it's that interesting, which I will show you in a while. All right, so we're not going to hack this device by just extracting the SPI flash. What's next? Well, you go find a UART port. I poked around the motherboard. Um, there are no obvious UART ports used for that purpose. But, I mean, the device charges via USB-C. Let's see if something happens on USB-C when we boot it up. Power on. Okay, something happened. Um, let's get back to it. Anything? Okay, so we've got something here. This is a prompt. User input receive switching to boot mode USB control. Okay, good. Um, a bunch of commands. Um, boot, reboot, reformat, NVRAM, R sick flash. Okay. Apparently, there's a bunch of interesting commands here. What version says? P2 boot, board P2, R3B. Uh, we're on a firmware from 2021, and the device is apparently locked, whatever that means. Okay, now I've, of course, been through these already. Um, you can do a interesting things here, but nothing that hacks the device. I, it's, it's, there's no issue with these commands being available. As you can see, the, um, the SPI flash of four megabytes, only half a megabyte is used. 
Uh, we got the files that we could see from our file system. Um, they are here. You also see that the application firmware and the boot firmware are not here. As I said, uh, going through this BIFS file system, I could see that they had been deleted. And, uh, and since we know what MCU is in this device, uh, we also know that it has a one megabyte internal flash. Um, so apparently the device or the, the, the files are first loaded onto the external flash somehow and then programmed onto the internal flash. All right. Um, what else can we see here? Well, we can see these interesting commands. Rx file name size, Tx file name. And they are indeed uh, receive and send over X modem, the nice little ancient protocol. So this is why I said that while I can extract the files from the SPI flash, it's not of that much use because I can just connect to the device via USB and um, transfer the files out of there and also transfer files to the device. Now that's quite nice and then we'll get back to that at some point. And so I guess the most interesting command here is uh, vault. Okay, vault list add add file finalize. Vault list. Okay, so I think it's safe to say that this is not one of those IoT devices where people don't know how to use encryption. We have an S flash key, I'm guessing secure flash. A SEC flash key, well, it sounds like secure flash. Firmware over the air, signing, set pub key. Um, 452 bytes, setup key 889. I'm guessing both of those are public key crypto. SEC boot key, secure boot and a device token. So something that's unique per device. Okay, well, if this company knows how to do valid encryption, I think that we're gonna be in for some fun. Some of you might be a bit surprised. Uh, cybersecurity, hardware firmware hacking is not really what I talk about on this channel so far. And it's because even though I, this is what I work with, um, I'm not usually able to discuss in detail what I do. Um, this is a special case uh, and I'm extremely happy to be able to talk about this. Now, you might have seen uh, at one of the command prompts earlier in the video that uh, the, the investigation I did is a few months old. And so I just want to make that clear. Uh, everything that we're going to find out as we uh, progress here has been responsibly disclosed and handled by the vendor. So we've analyzed the file system and we found nothing that we could use there. Uh, we connected to the uh, serial port, got the prompt, found lots of commands. Uh, nothing there really helped us out all that much. So what's next? Well, let's find a debug interface. Um, this is an SDM32, so we're not really looking for JTAG. We're looking for the single wire debugger interface. And um, there's one there. Okay, so we've connected up our ST-Link version 2 um, debugging tool. Let's see if we have something here. So let's start with ST-Info probe. And we do. We have the correct chip, the SDM32 F412. We can see that there's uh, 256K of SRAM. Flash size, you know, it's, the tool can answer anything here. I, actually, if we just do it again, it's going to say something else. But the interesting part here is that as soon as I do anything, uh, the device disconnects and I have to uh, power cycle uh, the minute. Now, we actually do get a bit of information as to how that is. Uh, if you looked at the commands available um, when we connected to the minute uh, over serial, uh, you can see that there is a command called debug lock um, and it tells us that we need to be nice. So be nice. And then it says flash RDP enabled. RDP, well, that's readout protection. Here are some interesting things when we talk about RDP on the SDM32 chipsets. If we go through a presentation by SD Microelectronics, uh, so there's a level zero, no readout protection, RDP isn't active. There's a level one, memory readout protection, a level two, chip readout protection. And it, it will tell you that the RDP is pretty much the same from uh, one to two. So let's check that. Uh, RDP level one, 
No access. Read erase program to flash memory or backup SRAM. It says backup SRAM here. Um, access to protected memories, blah, 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 option bytes. All right. Um, in level one, read protection is set for the flash memory, the backup SRAM, and the backup registers. Let's continue. Uh, you can go from level one to level zero. That will erase the flash memory and the backup SRAM. In RDP level two, we have all the protections from level one. We disable JTAG and the single wire debugger completely. You can't boot from RAM or system memory, the bootloader. Um, uh, you can't change option bytes. And so it's uh, read our protection level two provides the same protection as in level one, but the protection becomes permanent. If, if you check everything here in these documents and on the wikis, etc., you will basically see this as RDP level one being the same as level two, but uh, you're able to rescue a device that's out on the market. All right, this is actually not the complete picture. And if you study this, you will see that there is one huge difference. In RDP level one, you are allowed to read out the SRAM. Um, let's see if we can read something out. If we do um, ST flash read the SRAM, it's at um, this memory location and it's 256K in size. That works. Uh, and if we now check that file, we can see that we have content. And it turns out that a lot of people, a lot of manufacturers, they uh, put the device in RDP1 because RDP2 means that uh, if something happens to the device out in the field, uh, you're pretty much screwed. Um, you won't be able to rescue the device while it's out at the customer. You can't be able to reprogram it, etc. So staying in RDP1 sounds, you know, safe and sound. And usually that's not a huge problem to be able to read out the RAM, because if you just have your stack content, if you just have some of the uh, heap content there and you take care when you do your development, you're fine. But in this case, Minute puts the whole of their bootloader in RAM. Of course, this is so that they're able to uh, reprogram the bootloader when they do firmware updates because it's not being used from flash. Now, the negative part of that is this is actually the Minute uh, P2 boot, the whole bootloader. This is the full binary, and while I've just been stepping here, and, and maybe this all looks a bit random, if we do strings on it, uh, you'll be able to see that there's some interesting stuff here. And here we go. Next up, we're going to go into Ghidra. All right, let's uh, stop there for this first video. Um, you might think that, wow, we can read out the SRAM. This is obviously the complete break. Um, you'll be surprised at how much we still have to go to get into this device. Um, part two, coming up soon. Cheers.